Podcast 11 of the Abdomen Series The Somatic and Autonomic Nerves of the Abdomen This podcast is going to describe both the autonomic and somatic nerves of the abdomen and will finish by detailing abdominal referred pain. So I'll start with a brief overview of the somatic nerves as these are relatively simple and then I'll move on to the autonomic nerves towards the end of the podcast. Now in podcast 9 I detailed a series of nerves that run along the posterior abdominal wall. There was the subcostal, iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal. Now as we noted in the thorax, the intercostal somatic spinal nerves formed horizontal bands across the chest and this banding continues across the abdomen. The intercostal nerves that extend along the side of the ribs now extend inframedially onto the anterior abdominal wall and this means that T5 to T8 nerves innervate the skin overlying the hypochondriac and epigastric regions. Nerves T9 to 11 innervate the skin over the lumbar and umbilical region with the skin over the umbilicus being specifically innervated by the 10th thoracic spinal nerve. T12 nerve is specifically named as the subcostal and the L1 nerve which gives rise to the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves innervate the skin of the inguinal and suprapubic region with the skin overlying the pubic symphysis being specifically innervated by the ilioinguinal. So in the second part of the podcast I'm going to detail the autonomic nerves of the abdomen. The autonomic nerves of the abdomen often cause much confusion so what I want to do in this podcast is to try and make the whole system a lot simpler and to do this I'm going to start off with a few definitions. So by now you all should be familiar with the differences between the somatic and the parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic is involved in fight or flight response and the parasympathetic is involved in the rest and digest response. So for the gastrointestinal tract this means that all the sympathetic fibres are going to vasoconstrict the blood vessels, reduce intestinal secretions and inhibit peristalsis. And this vasoconstriction frees up blood and energy for the respiratory and muscular systems. Conversely, all parasympathetic fibres are going to cause vasodilation of the blood vessels, increase secretions and promote peristalsis and this is clearly going to aid digestion. So you should be fully aware of the specific effects of each division of the autonomic nervous system. Now other terms that cause confusion are the plexuses and the splanchnic nerves. So let's deal with a plexus first. Now a plexus is simply a network of mixed autonomic nerves and you have met these in the thorax with the esophageal, pulmonary and cardiac plexuses. And in the abdomen, there is going to be the celiac, superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric plexuses. This relationship between the main arteries of the gastrointestinal tract and the plexuses is important as it allows these plexuses to send out parasympathetic or sympathetic fibres towards the organs by piggybacking on the arteries that supply them. And these are via periarterial plexuses. The final structure I want to define are the splanchnic nerves and splanchnic nerves are simply nerves that are carrying autonomic information to visceral organs. Examples include the greater, lesser and least splanchnic nerves and these nerves are specifically carrying sympathetic information and these sympathetic nerves originate from the sympathetic trunk on either side of the vertebral column. There's also pelvic splanchnic nerves and these nerves are specifically carrying parasympathetic information. So a splanchnic nerve is just an autonomic nerve that is carrying either sympathetic or parasympathetic information to the organs. So let's detail how the celiac plexus, the superior mesenteric plexus and the inferior mesenteric plexus are formed and what they supply. To do this, it is easiest to divide the gastrointestinal tract of the abdomen into its three embryological divisions, the foregut, midgut and hindgut. Now you should be aware by now that these three divisions 
are reached supplied by the principal arteries of the abdominal aorta. The celiac trunk supplies the foreguts, the superior mesenteric artery supplies the midguts, and the inferior mesenteric artery supplies the hindgut. Now surrounding these arteries are going to be the three main abdominal plexuses. The celiac plexus around the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric plexus around the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric plexus around the inferior mesenteric artery. And hopefully you can now realise that these plexuses, which remember are networks of mixed autonomic fibres that surrounding these arteries are going to extend autonomic fibres to the specific organ by piggybacking on the arteries as periarterial branches. So the obvious question is what forms these plexuses? And this is the tricky bit. If you look in numerous textbooks, you will often get a complicated or contradictory description of the nerves that form them. At this point, you also have to wonder, is it absolutely necessary to know this in such detail? If you find it interesting, then maybe it's worth spending the time researching it. But I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. So we have these three plexuses. Now the celiac plexus is going to give autonomic information to the foregut. The superior mesenteric plexus is going to give autonomic information to the midgut. And then the inferior mesenteric plexus is going to give autonomic information for the hindgut. Now we also have a series of sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. And each of these plexuses is going to be formed from inputs by these nerves. So let's list the nerves we are going to use. The abdominal parasympathetic nerves are the vagus and the pelvic splanchnic nerves. The vagus is the tenth cranial nerve originating from the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. The pelvic splanchnic nerves emerge from the S2 to S4 segments of the spinal cord. The abdominal sympathetic nerves are the greater, lesser and least splanchnic nerves. And there is also some lumbar splanchnic nerves. For those that are interested, the greater splanchnic nerves comes from T5 to T9, the lesser splanchnic nerves from T10 to 11, and the least splanchnic nerve from T12. The lumbar splanchnic nerves come from L1 to L2. So which of these nerves form the celiac plexus? Well, the celiac plexus receives parasympathetic inputs from the posterior vagal trunk not the anterior vagal trunk, as it finishes on the anterior surface of the stomach. And it receives sympathetic inputs, mostly from the greater splanchnic nerve, but it also has a small contribution from the lesser splanchnic nerve. So celiac plexus primarily formed from the posterior vagal trunk and the greater splanchnic nerve. So which of these nerves form the superior mesenteric plexus? Well, the superior mesenteric plexus is in connection with the celiac plexus which is superior to it. And along with these inputs, it also receives parasympathetic inputs from the posterior vagal trunk and sympathetic inputs from the lesser and least splanchnic nerves. So the superior mesenteric plexus is primarily formed again from the posterior vagal trunk and from the lesser and least splanchnic nerves. The third of these pre-vertebral plexuses is the inferior mesenteric plexus. This is connected to the superior mesenteric plexus via the intermesenteric plexus and it also receives parasympathetic inputs via the pelvic splanchnic nerves. Remember these come from the spinal cords S2 to 4 segments. Its sympathetic inputs come from the lumbar splanchnic nerves and remember these come from the L1 to 2 spinal cord segments. You should notice that the vagus nerve does not form part of the inferior mesenteric plexus and therefore the vagus nerve finally finishes after descending from the medulla through the neck and abdomen to supply up to the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. The final organs to mention in the abdomen are the kidneys and these are supplied by the renal plexus which is formed from the posterior vagal trunk and the least splanchnic nerve. So the main take home message from the description is that the celiac plexus, the superior mesenteric plexus, 
and the inferior mesenteric plexus surround the three corresponding arteries and therefore the celiac plexus supplies the foregut, the superior mesenteric plexus supplies the midgut and the inferior mesenteric plexus supplies the hindgut. The celiac plexus is formed principally by the posterior vagal trunk and the greater splanchnic nerves. The superior mesenteric plexus is also formed by the posterior vagal trunk and the lesser and least splanchnic nerves. And the inferior mesenteric plexus is supplied by the pelvic and lumbar splanchnic nerves. If you want to know details beyond what I've mentioned here, then you can do a review of the textbooks and various other teaching resources available. But for now, I think that's enough. So to finish the podcast, I want to discuss the referred pain of the abdomen. There are two types of referred pain I want to detail, and that is visceral or poorly localised and somatic or localised pain. Let's start with the visceral or poorly localised referred pain. You should remember from the thorax that referred pain is the sensation of pain from a different location to the source. So for the abdomen, this same rule applies. Pain originating from the abdominal organ due to irritation or infection is going to deliver this information via the afferent sympathetic nerves, remember also known as the visceral sensory nerves, to the spinal cord, where this information is perceived by the brain to originate from the skin that is supplied by the cutaneous nerves of that spinal cord segment. This means that the distribution of this pain is therefore going to follow the dermatomal pattern on the surface of the abdomen. So let's do an example. An esophageal or gastric ulcer is going to refer to the epigastric region. Why? Because the lower part of the esophagus and the stomach are part of the foregut. The foregut is principally supplied by the celiac plexus and the main sympathetic contributor to the celiac plexus is the greater splanchnic nerve. The greater splanchnic nerves come from T5 to T9, spinal cord segments, and the dermatomal level of T5 to T9 is the epigastric region. So another example, if it was an organ of the midgut that was damaged, then it would be referred via the superior mesenteric plexus, which has its sympathetic inputs from the lesser and least splanchnic nerves, and these come from the T10 to T12 spinal cord segments and the T10 to T12 dermatomal level is the umbilical region. And finally, for a hindgut organ, it will be referred by the inferior mesenteric plexus, which has its sympathetic input via the lumbar splanchnic nerves. The lumbar splanchnic nerves come from L1 to 2, and the L1 to 2 dermatomal level is the suprapubic region. So a dull, poorly localised sensation of pain referred to either the epigastric, umbilical or suprapubic region can indicate irritation or damage to either a foregut, midgut or hindgut organ. Importantly, just like referred pain of the thoracic viscera, the visceral afferent fibres return to the spinal cord alongside the efferent sympathetic fibres. Now let's just mention somatic or localised pain. If the organ that's been damaged becomes severely inflamed to such an extent that the parietal peritoneum becomes involved, then because the parietal peritoneum is supplied by somatic nerves, then this pain is going to be well localised as this specific spinal nerve is going to be triggered. So let's do an example of an inflamed appendix. During the early stages of appendicitis, when just the appendix is involved, because the appendix is part of the midgut, the pain will be poorly localised to the umbilical region. But as the parietal peritoneum that overlies the appendix becomes involved, the somatic nerves that innervate the peritoneum in the right inguinal region are going to localise the pain to this precise region. So for an appendicitis, pain will initially be dull in the umbilical region and it will then spread to the right inguinal region and will be severe. The pain will be particularly severe when the skin surrounding it is stretched. So when the area is palpated, the parietal peritoneum is stretched. When the palpating fingers are suddenly removed, severe pain is experienced 
and this is known as rebound tenderness. So in this podcast, I've detailed the somatic nerves of the abdominal wall and the autonomic nerves of the abdominal viscera, including referred pain. In the next podcast, number 12, I will consider some clinical aspects of the abdomen.